in How Music Got Free, Stephen Witt reveals the real story behind the greatest music pirate in history you've never heard of, the most powerful music executive, an illegal website four times the size of the iTunes store, and far more in this secret history of digital music piracy. You know, this was before Napster. This was before peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And so my entire freshman year of college, I was just out there poking around on the internet for pirated music files, which, you know, it was more like walking into a souk or like a, a, an open-air drug bazaar in some, you know, housing project somewhere. It did not look like the internet of today. There was like digital graffiti everywhere. Everyone was posturing. Nobody had their identity online. It was essentially impossible to make any kinds of transaction. And there was all this pirated media showing up everywhere. Uh, and I became obsessed with that. So that was what imprinted me on the internet. And that became my default expectation of what the internet was, was this chaotic, anarchic, free-for-all zone with no adult supervision where everyone could just rip each other off. I grew up with that. And as the internet evolved into the mid-2000s, I became a serial pirate, you know, going into these, into these chat rooms and then later these peer-to-peer -peer services and just hoovering up every everything i could find you know tens of thousands of albums that i was never going to listen to but i was a hoarder like a digital hoarder and this became like a big part of my identity as i grew older you know i kind of got over it a little in my late 20s early 30s i was like this is kind of a weird hobby to have but what happened how was that possible how was any of this possible so, you know, I still had no understanding of how they'd ever managed to shrink the compact disc files by, by 90%. So I Googled, you know, MP3. This is maybe 2008, 2009. And I got to the Wikipedia page for MP3 at the time. And there was just no real information on it. There was just no explanation of what had happened, really. And I was stunned by that. I was certain that, you know, uh, there must have been volumes of books written about this particular topic. And to my amazement, there was almost nothing. Now, I had wanted to be a writer for a long time, and I was kind of affecting a career transition into that mode. And I was like, gosh, this is like the perfect book for me to write. And somehow, to my astonishment, even to this day, I'm astonished by this. Nobody had just jumped on it. Nobody had told the story. So I took it upon myself to tell it and found some of the most fascinating and extraordinary things, you know, because they weren't on Wikipedia, because they hadn't been published anywhere. It ended up being 75 or 80% original research, original interviews, piecing things together from various documents and FBI files and interviews. And finally, I emerged with this kind of astonishing narrative about what had actually happened. And that became my book. What do the music executives that you write about uh, think of you or think about your book? Do they think you were critical of them or would they in retrospect be honest enough to know that they were maybe a little asleep at the wheel? They will never admit that they were wrong. <laughs> but well, most of them are probably not paying any attention, if we're being honest. These guys aren't necessarily big readers. Um, but I think, I think that they were in a... As I grow older and closer to their age... And further from the age that I was when I was pirating, I do understand how hard it would have been for them to make the right move. Here's the thing you have to remember. We take it for granted now that the internet's going to come and disrupt and destroy everything. That was not the default expectation in 1997. Nobody, the internet looked so cheap. It looked just like this budget chat room. There was no Amazon, really. I mean, there was, but you, you, not really. Google didn't exist yet. No Facebook. No Instagram. It looked like a bunch of... It looked like what it was, which was a bunch of dorky boys poking around. It was, yeah, it was also entirely male as well. And the music executives were very resistant to adopting a model of internet distribution because the compact disc was so profitable. And they knew that if they started to put out music in MP3 format or some other format, that it would take the model that they had, which was an album sales model based on singles, which is incredibly profitable, and disaggregate the single from the album. So the analogy that I like to use is that I'm an author, right? 
I'll tell you that I'll tell you just straight away the dirty secret of the publishing industry, the book publishing industry, is probably the majority of what gets sold never gets read. So people buy these books, they own them, and they do not read them, but I still get paid. Now, imagine we move to an economic model where I was only paid for exactly the words that somebody read in my book. Well, that would be an economic catastrophe for me. And it would be an economic catastrophe for the entire publishing industry and the book publishing industry. And that is essentially what happened to the music industry. You know, someone like Vanilla Ice would have a hit single and then they would sell 20 million albums, albums, 10 or 15 songs, right? Um, at an enormous markup and everybody who'd been involved in the production of the album would get a slice based on this one hit single. Digital distribution and the MP3 format came along and, and exploded that, it blew it up and, and returned the industry to a, a much less profitable mode of operation. And so I understand why the executives were really reticent to go there. You know, it permanently shrunk their industry. And what would have had to happen is some visionary guy would have had to stand up on the conference table at Universal and be like, we have to do this or we're all going to be destroyed. And eventually they did say that, but they were five or six tiers too late. It was very hard for them to understand what was going on. It was very hard for everyone to understand what was going on. Um, when you talked about business, you didn't really talk about data. You talked about what their conception of business was, which was inventory, units, revenues, brick and mortar model, right? And what the MP3 guys were able to realize was that when they went to Sam Goody and looked at those racks of CDs at the mall, that was not inventory. It was just an array of inefficiently stored data. In retrospect, it seems obvious, but at the time, that would have seemed like a bizarre and even radical thing to believe. And certainly within the music industry, uh, the guys who were producing and distributing the stuff did not think about it that way. And it took, and that had to get, get, get beaten into them that that's what, that was the reality. It's very interesting living through the confusion of that as an artist or as an executive because I am old enough to live through a time when the whole DSP wave, the what is this Spotify, wait, Apple Music, you don't have to pay, what's a free model on Spotify. I remember when. Taylor Swift boycotted putting her music on Spotify. She didn't believe in streaming. So th oh. there is a bit of empathy in, in the, the fastness of innovation where it's very hard to see clearly what these things are going to be. So I can kind of sympathize with the execs. It wasn't, you know, Steve Jobs didn't like streaming. Uh, Apple yeah. had to play catch up. He didn't. He had blocked it uh, internally within the company. And when Spotify started to succeed, Apple Music had to rapidly pay catch up because they were still attached to the iTunes digital download and distribution model. I mean, I think they have caught up, but they, it, you know, Spotify for a time was forcing them off their own desktops. Um, so, so it's, it was not obvious. Here's the thing about streaming was the first streaming players were went back to like 2002. They introduced proto streaming models in kind of before Spotify and people were not subscribing. Um, it took them a long time to come around and what it really took was a smartphone and 4G and a bunch of technologies that made streaming work that uh, were not there in like the 90s. I talk about this in my book, the original model for the MP3, the original concept for it, and this is in the 1980s, was essentially a proto streaming model. The idea was that you were supposed to you know, log in uh, with a telephone, call into like a central server with a telephone punch in the key number of the song you wanted to listen to. And then it would, you know, stream the song back through your digital telephone line. And they would use MP3 compression technology to shrink it. So they filed a patent for that concept in 1982. And the patent was rejected by the German patent authorities because they hadn't specified a way to kind of deliver the music. They hadn't figured out how to shrink it yet. And so the impetus to shrink the music came from the desire to create a streaming uh, service that would put an end run around the compact disc stores. So we live in that reality now. That happened finally, but there was 40 years of chaos in between. You touched on it a little bit with Steve Jobs and the iPod, but is it accurate for me to think while the invention of the MP3 was foundational, it wouldn't matter until there was hardware to support it, until there were affordable, high quality MP3 players? Is that when 
this whole thing blew up when you can actually take this off your computer, DJ a party, show it to your friends in a car? Is, is the hardware the, the true spark? Right. So this is an interesting facet of it. When we were online in the 90s, the late 90s, ripping off these MP3s, once we got the files on their computer, they were, they were stranded. They were stuck there. And you got to remember, a computer in the 90s was like this big beige box. It was not a portable thing. It was a heavy thing that weighed 20, 25 pounds and had a fan and didn't work. They crashed constantly. They didn't work very well. Um, and so to try and connect that to a stereo, it, you could, but you could not take it for a run. And it was difficult to get an MP3 playing in your car. I remember trying to do this and how challenging it was. You know, you could burn six or 700 MP3s to a compact disc um, and then sort of put it on there. But at least initially, there was a moment where MP3 piracy was actually fueling compact disc sales, I think, because it was acting as a kind of uh, inferior good that prompted this consumer to go buy a compact disc after they heard the MP3. Once the gadgets came along. Once the iPod and similar technologies came along, that liberated the consumer. You know, Apple really, at the time Apple introduced the iPod in 2001, they were a third tier technology player. Microsoft was 33 times larger than Apple when it came out. And they had been seen as a kind of niche, quirky company that had done some interesting things, but were not the dominant technology player. And they invented the iPod, and even Jobs didn't quite understand what he had. Uh, but functionally, what he had was like the vaporizer. If if MP3s were illegal drugs, then Apple had invented the vaporizer. It was a it was a device that was only going to be used, really, in the end, to facilitate piracy. It could hold ten thousand songs, sure. And Apple's out there selling MP3s for ninety nine cents, sure. But who on earth? is going to fill up their iPod by paying $10,000. I don't think that literally ever happened. Uh, not once. Everyone's going to go rip it off and fill up their iPod with pirated music. And, you know, I had a full iPod. I had a 120 gig iPod and it was full. And I did not pay $10,000 to the artists. You know what I'm saying? So they knew. And to a certain extent, it turbocharged their entire company and ecosystem. And the ultimate reality of smartphone existence can trace its roots to the iPod and therefore to piracy itself. So there was a liberating effect of this for some of the technology companies, especially the gadget manufacturers. It really, it really spurred them to the next wave of, of, of um, digital computing. So do the majors come in and attempt lawsuits or anything towards the hardware? All right, I, I assume that would be step two. Why is Apple selling these things that not one person is going to fill with legitimate content? They tried. They tried to sue the iPod out of existence. Um, but actually, they didn't even try to sue the iPod. They tried to sue the previous generation of MP3 players out of existence. And ultimately, the judge ruled that an MP3 player is just a hard drive, which is true. And so you can't really regulate it. It's just a store of data. You know, you can't, there's nothing you can do. And so once that judgment came in, I believe it was RIAA versus Diamond, um, then the major tech, because they all these like kind of, you know, shady third tier technology players had been making MP3 players and the big boys wouldn't get involved because they didn't know the legal situation. But once it became clear that this was a legal device, Apple moved quickly to fill a vacuum that Sony really should have filled and they had a lot of problems at Sony and didn't invent the iPod, although they ought to have. And instead, Apple invented it and became, you know, for a time, I mean, still really the most profitable company on earth. Did the iTunes store win because of convenience based on if I'm pirating music, there might be a virus, I might be clicking, this is clickbait, this isn't the right song, oh, this is crashing my device. Did the iTunes store pick up steam because it was just, hey, you're going to pay a dollar and this is what you're going to get? Or did it pick up steam because they allowed the purchase of singles? It wasn't in an album only uh, format. Or did they start picking up steam because people started getting scared of, of getting in trouble? I'm, I'm curious to see how the iTunes store worked because I, I, I wasn't fully around for, for the time when people were paying 99 cents per song. Yeah, well, they weren't. I mean, this is the thing. In aggregate, the iTunes store was a failure. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, we don't use it, right? Um, and it actually, 
coexisted with the absolute nadir, the absolute worst time for the majors. That was when their revenues went to almost nothing, right? It was possible to believe they would just cease to exist. The music industry would just cease to exist and you'd have publishing and, and live and that would be it, but there would be no recording industry. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I was kind of thinking that you know, in, in the late 2000s. I was like, these guys will never recover. Uh, and certainly not through the iTunes store, you know, um, that did, that did, that probably honestly in aggregate ended up, it was great for Apple. It was great for Steve Jobs, but you could make the argument that in aggregate, it did more harm than good to the recording industry. Um, but you know, Jobs was very charismatic. Everybody knows this. And the thing that he designed was looked very slick with its all white interface. And it created this ecosystem with the iPod that everybody loved. And so its success was actually based on not so much selling it to the consumer, although he did a great job of that, but really convincing guys like Doug Morris and Jimmy Iovine and Roger Ames and all the rest of the music executives to get on board, uh, which they had been very, very reluctant to do for precisely the reasons I specified. But he charmed the pants off of them. You know, he was Steve Jobs. And so they said yes. And I think in the end, it, they might have been better off. They just never done it, honestly. Uh, if they just waited it out and you know waited for Spotify or somebody to come along and stream, um, because streaming ultimately proved to be a much more profitable model for them and much more consumer friendly and just better all around. I mean, the era of digital distribution, legal paid distribution, lasted what you know, eight or nine years, like and it coincided with a massive wave of piracy. They were never able to put the genie back into the bottle. Um, I mean, it was enormously profitable for Apple because it brought all of these consumers into the much larger Apple product ecosystem and made them a ton of money. But for the labels, it was just a nightmare. It was a disaster. I mean, honestly, I think they might have been better off if they'd never signed on. When I think about the the moral questions in this, I think first and foremost, before I was an artist that got paid off of music, I didn't really understand a digital good could be stolen. It was very much don't steal from a store, don't go to HMV and steal their CD, but things on the internet. We didn't have that understanding. Maybe I came from a strange school or friend group, but it didn't feel necessarily like stealing until the labels started having a, a PR push. And then there'd be articles in the media of people getting in trouble. And then you'd see the FBI law enforcement thing on movies. And when I really sit with the moral thought of it now as an artist, it kind of sounds like the moral argument is is mostly for the label because even in 2021, my music gets uh, illegally downloaded all the time. There are YouTube channels that upload my music 24-7 and run AdSense on it. And in my world, uh, especially, and I think a lot of other artists that are signed to majors knowing the royalty structure, we want exposure first and foremost. We want live hard ticket sales. Exposure leads to hard ticket sales and festival bookings and merch sales. And maybe it's just me being 26 and this isn't the proper outlook for a more mature artist. But anytime I've seen substantial profit, it is off live music, hard tickets, hard merchandising, and the royalties in a streaming era, even millions and millions of streams. Uh, so I, I never felt like it was morally against the artist. It f always felt like the labels were trying to make it morally against their profit lines. Is that accurate in any way? Yeah. I mean, well, look, there was a time when they were just freaking printing money, right, off of album sales. And the older guys could remember that. And that was Nirvana, right? That was that was the, the glory days of Led Zeppelin, you know, like, or, or Thriller, you know, or even in the 90s, The Chronic. Yeah. Um, and so to, to lose that permanently was traumatic for them. I, I mean, they were confused and traumatized by their main source of revenue that had just was like a mint. It was a money factory for them just disappearing. Um, and so they always wanted to get back to that somehow. And they were never able to. Um, I think for younger artists, they don't really remember it. And so they don't. They don't, you know, there was never a time that there was an expectation that that would happen. You know, live used to be like a loss leader. They would go out and tour to sell the album. You know, uh -huh. the concert was like, was a promotional vehicle for the album. It was the exact opposite of, of essentially what happens today. Um, and so the era of extreme profitability through album sales really only lasted in the end for 50 years. Uh, 
So maybe it was just a weird historical aberration. I don't think they'll ever get back there. Maybe they will, but um, I don't see how. They'd have to bundle it or package it in some new and different way. Um, you know, it's a little bit like newspapers used to make all of this money off classified advertising. That's gone forever. That's not coming back. Um, so often there are just shifts in distribution, technological shifts that can upend or destroy uh, income streams that look stable. Um, and I think if you were living in the end of the 20th century, you hadn't seen one of those for a while. So you kind of forgot that they could happen. But then the internet had that effect. As far as just ethics or morally, why do you think pop culture didn't feel necessarily like they were doing something horribly wrong? It, They're it, all teenagers. They don't care. I mean, <laughs> here's, here's the thing. It's not quite stealing. You know, if I steal your CD, I take it from you and you don't. There's an it. asterisk by the stealing because it's not a right. physical good, right? Whereas if I take your CD and make a copy of it and give it back to you, like I haven't harmed you. you know, what happened to you? Nothing. I didn't steal your CD. All that happened is that we did something where theoretically some third party rights holder is supposed to get paid when we do this. But in the absence of any kind of meaningful enforcement, it doesn't really feel like a crime. And, you know, intellectual property and copyright issues are quite complex. I mean, that's happening now with COVID, right? So you have these kind of like patented vaccines. Is it morally right to patent a vaccine? I don't have an answer, you know? So what that means in practice is if I start illegally synthesizing this life-saving medicine, are you going to come and destroy my factory with an ax? Like you might. And that, that actually used to happen all the time in the early days of copyright back in the 18th century. You'd have these bootleg book manufacturers just knocking stuff off in London, and then the authorities would come with a big axe and smash up the printing press. Um, and so the productive capacity of your society is limited to meet demands of artificial scarcity that are created essentially by powerful interest groups. It doesn't feel morally wrong when you put it that way, because it feels like you're sticking it to the man. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if you go into the record store and shoplift the thing, it's like, okay, you're stealing the guy's inventory. Like, come on. He's like a small business owner. Even if he's not, you know what stealing is. Um, making unauthorized duplications of things does not feel that way. And more strikingly, that was not done in a commercial mode online, right? So if I start ripping off your music and then selling it on the street, like, yeah, all right, you should probably get paid. But none of, no one was even selling anything. They were literally just sharing it. It wasn't even really like an economy necessarily. I mean, it was, but there was no pricing involved. Everything was literally free and it was being given away. This is one of the difficulties that the FBI had in securing prosecutions against some of these pirates is that the juries would hear this and they would be like, this does not sound like an organized crime ring because there is no money involved. You know, like they're just not making money doing this. They're engaged in this behavior. They're pirating all these artists. They're distributing the stuff everywhere. And it's, it's just all downside. It's all risk. They're doing it for thrills. There's no cash coming in. And so that expectation or model of behavior is very much at odds with the modern uh, internet, which is all about cash, right? Crypto or speculation on you know day trading stocks. And it's funny to see how much the internet has shifted from, from when I was probably closer to your age. We would never post our identity online, ever. It was inconceivable. It was all, it was all guys. There were no, I mean, like it was all guys. There were no girls. Um, and there was uh, just this veil of anonymity and a belief that there should be almost no money involved. In a, in a way, it was very utopian. It was very bizarre. Mm -hmm. And that flourished for that subculture, those cultural identities and beliefs flourished for about 10 years. And then a wave of venture capital, a second wave of venture capital uh, kind of colonized the internet and absolutely transformed it into 180 degrees the opposite of that. And that's the reality you probably grew up with. For some reason, I, I randomly thought it'd be very interesting to know how many artists actually built their career off of illegal leaks, uh, whatever that forum or subculture was, where an artist that maybe wasn't going to get a major label push, maybe wasn't going to get a music video on MTV and the internet by leaking a song that they thought was cool, ended up building that career in some small way. I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure the taste of that culture built artists, ironically. Well, I'll tell you a couple things that it did, for sure. 
it burnished the careers of certain legacy artists because you'd have these guys who were washed up and nobody cared about them. And then people would rediscover their music via streaming and YouTube and they would come back in just like the most extraordinary way and suddenly become economically viable again. Um, it had a transformative effect on rap music in particular, um, the way it was distributed, thought about, and analyzed and parsed. Um, in aggregate, it pr it's very hard to say where we would be culturally, what differences would exist culturally in terms of music had none of this happened, had somehow, you know, they managed to get streaming working in 1998 and, and none of this ever happened. Where would we be culturally? How would that be different? It's impossible to say, really. But I will observe that most of the shifts that happened in music culturally were actually not the, the product of piracy or distribution. The big thing that happened, and I lived through this, was that live instrumentation. So when I was a kid, and this will really date me, but 1993, I was like pestering my mom to get an electric guitar because that's what Kurt Cobain had. And that's what all these guys, these heroes of rock had. And by the time I got to college, I noticed like not a lot of people were playing electric guitars anymore. They had shifted to digital audio workstations, which provided this like kind of sonic palette to produce anything you wanted to. Rock music started to decay and, and die and club music and rap music started to take over because that's what was at their fingertips. Um, and so the idea of pestering your parents to get an electric guitar now you know, it's like learning to play the trombone. It's an instrument and maybe it's worthy of study, but you're not going to be very cool. Um, and so that shift was inevitable and actually had nothing to do with piracy. It, it was a production shift in the way that music was made. Um, you know, as certainly as the introduction of the electric guitar in the 1950s was a production shift, the introduction of, you know, Pro Tools and, and Audad, any digital audio workstation, by the way, all of which we were pirating, so that was a part of it. But I remember seeing Reason, which was one of the most heavily pirated uh, workstations at the beginning, Fruity, Fruity Loops or whatever it was. Like, and then you'd have these dweebs in their dorm rooms sitting there, you know, just like these wood shedding Jimmy Page types in the 70s would just like retreat to their rooms with a guitar and master it over the course of a year and a half. You had a new kind of guy who did that, but with, and, and increasingly women as well, who did that with, um, you know, Pro Tools. And they emerged uh, with the ability to just make the club shake, you know, in a way that was radical and new. And that was the sound that took over. And I think that was probably going to happen regardless of piracy. I don't think that's an effect of piracy. I think something else is going on. That's really interesting that you brought that up because I couldn't tell you how many major label artists I know, seven-figure touring artists, say I had a cracked version of Ableton, I had a cracked version of FL Studio, or amazing visual designers I know selling NFTs for a million dollars that had cracked Photoshop. It's, it's incredible true. to think that that lowered the bar to entry for lower middle class to have the tools to end up creating these seven-figure uh, businesses. So there, there's and some that, beauty that was, to it. That to me was the real shift. Yeah. That's what upended everything. Be at least from a cult. Now, from the profit perspective, from the labels perspective, and from the consumer, the customer perspective, that was not what happened. And I think most customers are sort of unaware. Yeah. But the, the death of rock music can be traced to the introduction of cracked digital audio workstations on our desktops in the late 90s and early 2000s for the first time. Because you could, you think about these kids that are poor kids in a basement. These softwares at retail were $999. The plug-in was this. So it, it's incredible. And I actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I never thought of that in doing research for this, how maybe some of our favorite artists to this day and some of the guys that I'm inspired by that are now fueling the new streaming era started because of torrents and crack software. So there, there, there's a little beauty to that. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a very tough hypothetical question. Let's say you are Doug Morris and yeah. I'm your intern and I'm coming into your office at the peak of this and I'm saying, we got a huge problem here. Don't know how these things are happening. What do we do to get this ship back on a, a proper course? Do you say let's embrace streaming or do you even know what that is? What would you do if you were Doug that Doug failed to see? There was nothing he could do. Wow. There was truly, in 2004, let's say, 
as the as the wheels were really flying off the bus. Um, okay, what they should have done, and this is not entirely their fault, is they should have just banded together and purchased Napster and rotated it into a um, into like a, a kind of a free freemium model. Okay. Um, maybe that would have worked. It probably wouldn't have worked, but it would have given them a foothold online uh, and a lot of consumer goodwill. The problem was the guy running Napster was this tremendous asshole. Uh, not not Sean Fanning, but his uncle John Fanning was just this lunatic and wouldn't cut a deal at almost. And he, ultimately, they cut some kind of deal. They but he was trying to ransom them and they wouldn't pay the ransom. And I kind of understand where they were coming from. But they had to just fucking buy it, and they didn't do it. Um, that was the big mistake. They they just had to pay this one tremendous asshole a ransom so they could own Napster. And pride. I mean, this guy was a real jerk, and nobody wanted to pay him off. And they ultimately sued Napster out of existence, which did not accomplish anything from their perspective. It it was spite. You know, they did that out of spite, but they spited themselves. And nobody wanted to deal with this one guy, and so I understand why they didn't want to do that. But if you think about really smart business moves that have been made over the digital era, one of the very smartest was when Facebook bought Instagram. And at the time, Instagram had like freaking, I had like 18 employees or something. And they bought it for like well over a billion dollars. And I remember people just like chortling and being like, look at Mark Zuckerberg. What a freaking idiot buying, you know, this tiny little service for an enormous premium. But guess what? Zuckerberg's a lot smarter than you. And he saw that this could evolve or grow into something that would act not only like dwarf his original business, but kind of synthesize perfectly with it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the streaming guys, uh, 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 or the, the the record label guys were there with Napster. I think internally there was some cognizance that they just had to buy Napster and they couldn't get the deal sealed. And I think if they had, the world would be really different. We talked about the Zuckerberg Instagram acquisition as brilliant, Napster as a failure. How similar is your book and this story to a story like Blockbuster saying no to Netflix? How similar is how music got free to how movies and film got free. Are, are there similarities that you can draw? Um, yeah, for sure. Oh, well, there's one big di there's one big similarity, which is obviously, you know, Blockbuster did not look at the racks of videotapes on its wall and think this is an inefficiently stored array of data. Right? That was a cognitive leap that the Blockbuster executives were just fucking <laughs> never going to make. Right? Like they were not there. Um, and Reed Hastings, I think probably. We, uh, intuited or saw that very early. Um, so that was very similar. Um, I, the big difference was actually, it, you know, in, you asked me, you know, how would the culture be different? The thing that, so when I was growing up, the way that we watched TV was we, it was a bunch of crap and we surfed the channel and we clicked around 40 times a second. Okay. Whereas music was album oriented and we would put it on and listen to it, the entire album for a 45 minute stretch and try and understand what the artist was communicating. Today, we have the exact opposite phenomenon. People will sit there and watch television for eight or nine hours at a stretch, the same show. They're binge watching it. These kind of long, complex, soap opera like serial narratives that are just compelling when done correctly. And music is channel surfing, right? It, you have a playlist with 300 artists on it and you're listening to 30 second snippets of the song, the part that you like that you think goes hard because you're at the gym, you know, and then you're like, all right, well, I need more energy. And so you pop to the next part. Like it's actually even rare to listen to a full song in some ways. Um, and so the digital, the, the pipeline, the digital pipeline has inverted those two things. Television, which was like, and even movies, which were like appointment viewing that you kind of, or, I mean, you know, that you kind of surfed around or on, are now completely these kind of serial narratives. And this is true podcasting as well, obviously. And music is channel surfing. Music is, you know, listening to 35 songs in 20 minutes. That's uh, something that I talk about, obviously, with my team and my label, the idea of passive listening versus uh, a real fan seeking out your music. And that's something every artist is dealing with. I've had experiences where I've had a million streams on Spotify convert to 1,000 Spotify followers. 
the idea yep. of 1 million unique streams converting to 1,000 people really shows that very few are seeking your songs and digesting. This is a playlist 30 second culture. And that's something uh, every artist is trying to grapple with and find ways right. around. It's, it's quite challenging. I mean, look, it was always, it was never an easy business. You go back and talk to the guys from the eighties for every Dr. Dre you have, there's a hundred guys who are like, yeah, I got signed to Universal. I put out one album and I disappeared, you know? So it was never an easy business and it was always hard to break through the clutter. Um, uh, what makes it challenging now, I think, is that um, you will listen. Yeah, you'll listen to a song, enjoy it, and have no idea who produced it, where, when, or why. Uh, I was talking to Jimmy Iovine, uh, the producer, recently. So most of the label execs seem to be on. They like Spotify. They like Apple Music. And they kind of think that they've settled. So Iovine doesn't think that. He thinks that these services have another step to evolve because they don't really build a customer relationship with the listener. It's still very passive. He said exactly what you're saying. It's still, um, you know, it's, it feels like the electric company, the water utility. You plug in, it comes on, you're like, oh, great, water. You know, you never think about the water utility. You probably should. It's nice to have water in your house. And, you know, I would miss it if I didn't have it. But when I turn on the tap, it just comes on. And that's how it feels in music. So in some ways, the listener and consumer are more divorced from the artist and the musician and the creative process and connecting with them than ever before. It becomes this ambient wash of sound that is pleasant, but lacks meaning. Um, and pushing beyond that is a technology problem and a cultural problem that our society, or the music industry at least, has not conquered. I spoke to a guy named Matt Medved on this podcast recently. He was the founder of Billboard Dance. And I asked him about this question, and I asked him about his predictions for how DSPs will evolve. And in his mind, probably because he started uh, at Billboard, he believes that editorials and social aspects are going to start getting baked into playlists, where if an art, if you, a listener likes a song, they might get an article or an interview, an exclusive little clip. Um, the idea of editorials and adding a little bit more storytelling or maybe even a video to an extent was his prediction, but it's an inevitable hurdle that there is just a gap between the playlist. Yeah, and I mean, they should have like bought Tumblr. Yeah, you totally. Mean, they should have bought like some kind of teen venue because that, and this is, you know, the record industry essentially invented the teenager. Mm -hmm. This was not like a, this was not like a, a demographic that was marketed to, um, in isolation until like the 1950s when the record industry sort of identified them as the baby boomers, you know, back when they were teenagers and realized they could sell stuff to them. Um, and Tumblr or very, something like that is the latest manifestation of it. So you have, you know, this cultural explosion of creativity online that young people find a new space every few years and, it's Tumblr or it's some other service and they gravitate toward it. And the music industry is involved in some way, but they're never in control of that. And if they somehow, so we had MTV in the eighties and that was one of the first times that the music industry was like, Oh my God, we've created our customer service platform. You know, YouTube and Spotify don't provide that right now. And so there is a space there for you would think something, the problem is it's got to be cool, right? It's got to appeal to like a three teenager and it's hard for old guys to do that. You know, I mean, it's shocking that Doug Morris was able to do that actually. Um, and it is tough, you know, like I, I talk to, I'm 42 now and I talk to teenagers and I feel a million years old. I feel like I'm, you know, crawled out of a cave from the stone age. And it was ever thus, someday they will be me and they'll look at these teenagers from like 20, 40 and be like, look at these kids. Um, but it's from a business perspective, it's really hard actually to connect. Um, and so they have to create some kind of youth facing platform that doesn't feel like grandpa designed it to be cool. And that's tough. You know, it's always been a challenge for them.